Welcome to Unit 7 of the course on Bayesian Probability Theory. My name is Wolfgang von der Linden and I will enable you to help Captain Bayes and her crew to fit data by model functions and to learn the basics of parameter estimation, prediction and classification of data as well as on model selection. We will learn how to apply Bayes' theorem to derive the probability distribution for the parameters of an assumed model. We will learn how to apply this probability distribution in the interpolation of data to help Captain Van find his treasure. And we will learn how to classify sea areas to be a nature reserve for frogfish or a general fishing ground. We begin with the classical regression problem. It is described as follows. Let there be a set of measured data that depend on some pivot points. These data points can be represented in an XY diagram. The measurements are in general not exact, but have some uncertainty that obey a certain distribution. In most cases, like in the situation of Captain Venn, these are additive Gaussian uncertainties. Next, we assume that without the experimental uncertainty, there is a relation between the intrinsic data and the pivot points that can be described by a deterministic function, for instance by a physical law, that depends on some parameters. Then the measured data can be described by adding the measurement uncertainty to the deterministic model function. Now the goals of regression are twofold. Parameter estimation. We would like to investigate the relation between measurement values and pivot points and therefore determine the model and its parameters A, their uncertainty and covariance. In the case of Captain Venn and his star path problem, the goal is to find the laws of how the stars, or rather the Earth, move. The model could include the rotation of the Earth around a tilted axis with respect to the elliptic orbit around the Sun. The parameters could represent the duration of such a rotation and the orbital period. The second aim of regression is to predict the values of the function at additional pivot point x star and their corresponding uncertainty. These additional pivot points could be such that it was not possible to realize a measurement at these points. Remember the case of Captain Venn, who was not able to determine the angles of the star Arcturus in the shortest night of the year due to bad weather. Another important application is to extrapolate physical properties from a small-scale experiment to a larger one, as is for instance done in fusion plasma reactors. Now we come to parameter estimation. For your orientation, we recapitulate the classical regression procedure before we introduce the probabilistic approach. As described before, we assume we have a suitable model, which is for instance given by physical laws or is obvious due to a visible trend of the data. A very prominent choice are linear models in which one uses a linear combination of suitable ansatz functions phi sub i of x with the coefficients being the parameters. Based on the model function, a cost function is introduced that quantifies deviations between model function and data. A very common cost function is the root mean square function. Sometimes the individual contributions get a weight according to the reliability of the measured data. Outliers thus have a very strong impact on the cost function. In the next step, the cost function is minimized with respect to the model parameters. This is the so-called least squares approach. In the case of linear regression in combination with a quadratic cost function, the minimization leads to a matrix equation, where the columns of the matrix M are given by the ansatz functions evaluated at the pivot points. If one is not entirely sure about the model function, in a final step one can evaluate the model function and discuss whether it has a reasonable behavior. This would lead to the field of hypothesis testing. Now we come to Bayesian parameter estimation. We have already mentioned several times that probability theory represents the consistent calculus for dealing with uncertainty. 
The general approach is the following. First, we have to fix all assumptions, like the measurement data are given for certain pivot points, the data can be described by an assumed model, the experimental noise follows a given distribution, and so on. Then we have to specify the questions we are interested in, like what are the values of the parameters, what would be the value of the measured quantity at a new pivot point, is the assumed model the right one, what if there are outliers, which means individual data points that are corrupted by external influences and do not obey the assumed error statistics. Finally, we compute the corresponding probabilities. We will see at the end of this section when and under which conditions the previously presented statistical procedure is justified. The probability density for the parameters in the light of the measured data is the posterior probability that can be simplified by Bayes' theorem. The normalization is independent of the parameters and can be determined in the end. The prior probability encodes our knowledge about the parameters before we take into account the experimental data. If nothing is known at all, the most ignorant prior is the uniform prior, maybe within certain parameter ranges. We will discuss in the next unit how ignorant priors can be determined purely based on considerations of symmetries and invariances. A crucial element in Bayes' theorem is the likelihood. If the measured errors are uncorrelated, the likelihood factorizes. In the case of additive Gaussian noise with noise level sigma nu, we can express the likelihood of one data point given by the model function f and the parameters a. Since we are interested in the probability density of the parameters a, we only need the terms that depend on them. We can replace the product of the exponential by the exponential of the sum. This misfit term chi-squared corresponds to the cost function which we saw in the classical regression procedure. If there are uncertainties in both coordinates and if the regression function is linear in x, then the misfit is given by the following expression. In summary, we find the following probability density function for the parameters. More on the difference between PDFs and probability distributions will follow in the next unit. An obvious way to decide on the parameters is to take the maximum of the posterior probability density, the so-called MAP solution. In the case of a flat prior, this solution is equal to the maximum likelihood. The maximum likelihood choice of the parameters is the basis of parameter estimation in conventional statistics. If in addition the likelihood is Gaussian, as in the present case, then the MAP and the maximum likelihood solution is obtained by minimizing chi-squared, which is the least squares method that we discussed before. This shows that the least squares approach is only applicable in the case of Gaussian experimental noise and if we have no or if we ignore prior knowledge about the parameters. In general, the MAP and hence the maximum likelihood solution is not very robust and highly susceptible to noise. In particular, if the likelihood is not unimodal, which means it has several peaks, the maximum can be misleading if it does not carry the dominant probability mass. A more reliable characterization of the parameters is given by the posterior mean. Here we finally need the normalization, which can be obtained by the following integral. It cannot be overstressed that a single value for the parameters, be it given by the map or the mean, is meaningless if we do not know the uncertainty. The uncertainty can be quantified by the variance. In many cases, also the covariance is of great interest. It tells us whether uncertainties are correlated. For instance, it could be that only a combination a sub 1 plus a sub 2 is well defined by the data, while the individual values are not. This can be seen in the covariance. Now we turn to the predictive aspect of regression. 
we are interested in the function value y star at a new position x star given the data d. If the pivot point x star lies within the set of given pivot points, we call this type of prediction an interpolation, otherwise extrapolation. The naive and inconsistent approach would be to replace the unknown parameters by the estimated ones obtained before and just insert x star in the model function to obtain the function value at the desired point. The correct approach, however, is to determine the probability density for the function value y star given the data. We can compute y star if we know the parameters. So we introduce them via the marginalization rule. Then the moments of y star are. The result becomes particularly simple if the model function depends linearly on the parameters, where m of x is a row vector containing the ansatz function y sub j evaluated at x. Then the mean of the regression value y star is equal to the linear combination of the ansatz functions with the mean of the parameters. So in the linear case, this is an agreement with the naive approach with the parameters replaced by the posterior mean. For the variance of the regression value we obtain, the square root of the variance quantifies the uncertainty of the regression value. Captain Wen wanted to know the azimuthal or horizontal angles of the star archers at midnight on the shortest night of the year. Since the weather was cloudy on that day of observation, he wanted to infer the treasure's position by interpolating his measurement values. Captain Wen knows that the accuracy of his measurements is limited by his time measurement, which has an accuracy of about one minute. The uncertainty of his angle measurements is given by the sum of the deviations due to the time shifts plus the uncertainty of his sextant and compass. From test measurements, he knows the approximate deviations of the angles due to the time inaccuracy. We assume that the deviations of the angles are normally distributed with the derived sigma values just mentioned. Next, we assume a linear model for which we can apply the formulas we just derived. Following the Bayesian regression steps, we end up with a joint probability density for the linear parameters. And we can use them to derive a prediction for the desired angles. Have a look at the interactive Bluto notebooks to get familiar with other model functions and the numerical tricks to evaluate the integrals of the whole parameter space. Here you can also explore the benefits of using a better astronomical model to predict stellar orbits and check how well extrapolation works within several months. Now we turn to the classification problem. Given the classification labels for the two species of fish and their positions, the goal is to find the border between the fish reserves, which shall be described by a linear function. The function depends on some parameters a. Here m defines the model, or rather the set of ansatz functions, that are linearly combined, weighted by the parameters. For instance, we can have a linear model or a quadratic model. We can also construct an implicit function. When we insert the position x sub nu, y sub nu of the fish, the implicit function yields zero if the fish resides exactly on the boundary. Otherwise, the sign of the function tells us on which side of the boundary the fish is located. In order to derive the probability density for the model parameters given the positions and labels of all fish and the model M, we proceed in a similar manner as in the regression case. Bayes' theorem yields a proportionality to the product of likelihood and prior. The classification label C has been omitted in the conditional part of the prior as it has no implications. Moreover, we assume that the likelihood terms are uncorrelated, resulting in a product form. The individual likelihood factors are the probability to find a fish of a certain species 
at a specific position. Here, the model and the corresponding parameters are important because they define the boundary of the fish reserves. The likelihood is a property of the fish and is related to why and how they stick to their reserve. The likelihood could in principle be quite different for the classification of other objects. Nevertheless, the following considerations show how such classification problems are treated in the framework of Bayesian probability theory in general. As mentioned before, the sign of the implicit function tells us on which side of the boundary the fish is located. In the case of a linear implicit model function, the value of phi can be used to easily determine the shortest distance from the fish to the boundary. Just think of the Hessian normal form. Generally, for a fish at position x sub nu, we define the shortest distance to the boundary by the following expression. The distance is defined as positive if the fish is on the correct side of the boundary and negative otherwise. In order to obtain a probability that is constant for a fish in its own reserve and that decreases continuously to zero when crossing the border, we choose the logistic function. The likelihood then reads where 1 over beta defines the width of the no fish land in which the probability drops continuously to zero. Its area is assumed to be very small and the logistic function is almost a step function. Hence, the meaning of the normalization z is the size of the area of the two reserves. For simplicity, we assume that the dependence of these areas on the parameters a and on the fish label c sub i can be ignored. Then z is an unimportant constant. It happens that not all fish abide by the rules. Epsilon is the proportion of such fish and it is related to a slack variable in optimization problems. Epsilon makes the classification outlier tolerant. So by now we have all terms of the probability for the model parameters. From that we can determine the mean values of the parameters. A result is only as good as its uncertainty. It can be computed as follows. Finally, we can determine the mean and the variance of the boundary. So let's apply the Bayesian logistic classification approach to find the probability for the natural boundary of the fish reserves. Using the data Bernoulli provided leads to a probability density for the two parameters that can be visualized by semi-transparent border lines. It can be seen from the formula that the likelihood function is maximized if the number of outliers is minimized. See also the interactive Pluto notebook to play with the slack variable epsilon and other datasets. Another important question is the model selection. It means what is the probability that the correct form of the border is given by the model B if we know the position of all fish and their labels. Here Bayes theorem gives the following expression where the normalization can easily be computed in the end. Now we use the marginalization rule to introduce the model parameters. As long as we do not know better, we assume a uniform prior within certain parameter ranges. Here, V sub m is the prior volume that depends on the model. Then the probability for model m in the light of the data is given by the following expression. Here, omega sub m is the volume in parameter space allowed by the model. It should be noted that Occam's razor is an integral part of the Bayesian expression and it penalizes unnecessarily complex models. This concludes Unit 7. We have learned Bayesian regression and how to apply it to parameter estimation and model selection. We learned also how to predict unseen measurement values and their probabilities and we got insights into classification of data. Now it's your turn to actually find Captain Van's treasure in the Bluetooth notebooks, where you can also work on the boundary issue of Claire and Maccabe. Please feel free to ask questions in the forum and feel encouraged to test your knowledge in the quiz.